This is Your Anxiety Toolkit, episode number 194. Welcome to Your Anxiety Toolkit. I'm your host, Kimberly Quinlan. This podcast is fueled by three main goals. The first goal is to provide you with some extra tools to help you manage your anxiety. Second goal, to inspire you. Anxiety doesn't get to decide how you live your life. And number three, and I leave the best for last, is to provide you with one big fat virtual hug. Because experiencing anxiety ain't easy. If that sounds good to you, let's go. Okay, you guys, this, oh my gosh, I, (laughs) when I have a guest on, I know I always say this is like my favorite episode and that's because I am just, I do every single time. It's like my most favorite big thing. And so number one, thank you for giving me space to have and share these wonderful moments with you and these wonderful conversations. In today's episode, I had the most amazing conversation with Hayden Dawes. Now, Hayden Dawes is a a therapist, a PhD student. He is what he calls an aspiring compassion warrior. And we share and we talk about in the interview what that means. Hayden is just doing some really cool work. And And as I share and we go into detail in this episode, he's really brought up some stuff for me as I've watched him and learned from him. And it's been incredible to see this journey that it's, you know, put me on. So I cannot wait to share this episode with you. We're talking about radical permission, writing compassion slips for ourselves. We're talking about being petty (laughs) and it'll make sense when we get there. It's just such a beautiful conversation. So I'm so happy to share this with you. I'm going to get right to the episode now. For those of you who are new, welcome. And if you haven't already, please do go and leave a review. The reviews help us reach more people and gain the trust of more people. And so go ahead and leave a review wherever you listen. And let's get on to the show. Okay, well, welcome. I'm actually so excited to have this conversation. This was a really, really great one for me because I have with me Hayden Dawes. He is an aspiring compassion warrior, which I can't wait to hear more about what that means a PhD student. He is a social worker and has been practicing for many years. So thank you so much for coming on, Hayden. I am so excited to be here, to see your, no one else can see us, but to see your smile, just to see little old me, that just makes me even feel more welcome and more excited to be here. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, I am. I'm really excited. So so let me fangirl on you for a second. Is So for those who don't know, and, and you'll hear all about Hayden's work, is Hayden has this really cool Instagram profile, and I love the work you're doing with Compassion. But we're also going to share a a couple of other things that I love about your work. And we'll talk about that here very soon. But tell me about the work you're doing around like an aspiring compassion warrior. Tell me what that means and how you are putting that out into the world. Yeah. So one of the things as someone that was, I was raised, you know, in the Catholic church and Roman Catholic, and I've sort of looked for different faith traditions, things that kind of felt close to me and really fit my experience. And so stumbling upon sort of Buddhism and more contemplative practices like Quakerism and Buddhism and finding the idea of a bodhisattva, someone that is willing to just do the tough work of delving deeply into what it means to be human, the suffering piece to it, and learning from that experience and then trying to help others along the way as as we're all on this kind of human journey. So I said, you know, Bodhisattva is kind of a mouthful. Um, (laughs) Why don't I call myself a compassion warrior? And part of that is delving deeply into my own stuff and my own pains and challenges so that I can learn more about myself and be compassionate with that. And I can be compassionate with other people. Yeah. You're aspiring. I actually think you're a warrior. I don't think you're aspiring. You could Abs- drop the aspiring. <laughs> no, you think I should, you know, sometimes it's interesting. Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. It's like, I think part of the journey is like, am I really aligned with that completely? And what does the aspiring mean? And sometimes taking it out of like, let me hold closer to this idea that this is what I am. So I think that's in flux too, but I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course. Okay. 
So we talk a lot about compassion here on the show, but I love there's a little twist that you bring into it. So I'd love if you could share, you're often talking about the permission slip. Can you share with everyone, for those who don't know what that means, can you kind of give me a a little rundown of what that is? Yeah. So back in 2018, I had a friend of mine share on Instagram a haiku a day for 100 days. And I thought, you know, I'm not counting out all of those syllables. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but what I can do is, you know, kind of following up on the work of Brene Brown, I was like, you know, I can write a permission slip to myself a day. I can slow down and kind of center myself and think, if I think about the whole day that I'm going to have, what is it that I most need? What is the thing that I might need to give to myself? And I also know from my clinical practice, and I'm sure you can relate to this, people will come in and they'll say, you know, I'm thinking about doing this or I'm thinking about doing that. And like, sweetie, let's slow down. (laughs) You probably know exactly what you need to do. Well, I do. I'm like, yeah, you're looking for me to give you permission to do that. So I thought, well, what if we can just skip through that step? And like, what would it be like for me to start a practice that I was like, I'm going to offer myself this permission to do what is to do whatever that I might need in the world for myself. Why do you think people need permission from other people? first? Yeah, I think there's a lot of different factors, but I think we have a lot of different noise, societal noise about who you're supposed to be, who you're supposed to love, how you're supposed to walk in the world. I think some of that noise trickles into our family spaces. And we weren't, a lot of us taught to really trust our own intuition, our own inner guide. I might even argue the God that lives within us. So we end up kind of delegating that task to someone else because we've been practiced in that rather than really slowing down and listening and honoring the wisdom that dwells, I believe, in each and every one of us. Mm, Okay. So I love this. And I think that's so important, particularly for my community who have a tremendous degree of anxiety and they've sort of lost touch with their own guide and their own wisdom because fear runs the show all the time, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And I think that's true for anybody who has fear, but especially the folks who have like an anxiety disorder. And so I love that. Okay. So can you walk us through? So what would you do? Like, what do you say? Like WWHD, what would Hayden do? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. If I'm, I'm feeling really anxious, maybe my permission slip is, you know, Hayden, give yourself permission to just breathe. Or if that feels like too much, Hayden, feel, give yourself permission to feel your anxiety. Hayden, give yourself permission to feel your feet on the floor. Nothing else, nothing more, just feet on the floor. If your anxiety and sort of the thing that you need, you know you need to do is have that tough conversation, you know what? I'm going to give myself permission to be assertive and to ask for exactly what I need. Yeah. 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 So it's, I love that. So it's sort of in that compassion realm, it's got like the real boundary setting one, but also the the gentleness. So there's sort of both those pieces to it in, in many situations. Is it something that I, I know on, I think Twitter, you post on social, on Instagram, you post these, are these ones that you're writing because you really needed to hear it yourself? Like today, I, you know, or is it that you had a session with someone and you kind of wanted to put that out for other people? Like, how do you do it? Yeah, what a great question. You know, honestly, all of my permission slips that I've written are generally for myself. And I I, I want to think that is what connects with people. They know I'm not a phony. They know I'm not trying to, you know, sell them some program that I'm not trying to work myself. I've not scheduled any of my posts really thus far when it comes to my permission slips. So the ones I put on Twitter and oftentimes the one I put on Instagram, sometimes I'll pull back in sort of an archive of when I did in 2018, just to show people that I I too am on this path because I do think throughout my day, like, what is it that I need? Oftentimes with me, and I'm sure many of your listeners can really understand this, that I am someone that does a lot. So if anything, I need a lot more sort of like parasympathetic energy, giving myself permission to rest, giving myself permission to foster sort of self-love and self-acceptance. 
But then there might be some people that like your permission slip might be a little bit more of like, you need to get up, boo, and you need to go. (laughs) Exactly. I know it's true. It's true. As you were saying that, I mean, my permission slips are just, I can pretty much, I could write them for the next month. It would say, I give myself permission to rest. Like, I know it's going to say that. (laughs) But there are other people who will need for the next, you know, they will probably be able to recognize that their permission will need to say like, face your fears and and do the scary thing. Yeah. So that's beautiful. Well, and I think so, like, just to, to give you a little bit more of the story, I didn't know how much of a big deal that permission slips would be to my work until I was meeting with someone that was helping me to, like, think about my social media a little bit more, like, with more strategy. And she said, Hayden, you know, these permission slips are really cool. This is something that I think I could do. And um, my, my friend Emily, and I was like, uh, really? Like, I didn't see it. And that was maybe two or three years ago. And then what happened was last spring when I felt like COVID was making our world like so much smaller. And I was talking to my therapist and she was saying one of the themes that kept coming up was the sense of reminding people of the autonomy that they have. And so one big facet of this is permission slips remind us that we have the ability to choose. Even if you decide not to do that thing, it's so much more empowering to recognize that you're choosing not to do that thing. So then what happened was I said, well, what if I opened up permission slips for like 14 days on social media? My following was like much smaller than it is now. And I did it for 14 days and just how powerful it is to have a collective practice of people all over the world, all over the country writing permission slips because there's something so magical in that by you seeing me give myself permission, it's contagious. You then give yourself permission. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that's why it's so powerful, right? And, And it's interesting because I, and I hear people say this to me often too, is having a therapist, I think people see therapists as like, they're got it all together, which I most definitely do not. Girl. (laughs) And I'm not afraid to admit it. Like, I'm totally fine with it, but I still am shocked. And I say, tell people, I share my story because we've got to break the stigma that therapy is like this idea that you just get better kind of thing. Like, we're still so human. And I love that you're a therapist sharing it because I do think it helps people to recognize like, oh, that's not the goal. Like, I'm not supposed to be perfect. I, I'm going to be giving myself permission forever. You know, Absolutely. I love that you're doing it. Yeah. Like, it reminds me of, I was, I don't know, I was yappering about something with my therapist and she was like, hmm, are you trying to hack the human out of this process? <laughs> and I was like, I'm trying to hack the Hayden. <laughs> But later, it took me weeks later, I was like, gosh, she's so right. I'm trying to do this without feeling any discomfort. And that's not going to be possible. And okay. how beautiful is it that I can practice giving myself permission by practicing self-compassion literally for the rest of my life? Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, I don't love it, but it's beautiful. It Not is. all the time, but it's beautiful. No, it is beautiful. It is beautiful because it's like, you know, I I actually have a book coming out on self-compassion. For, Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's not out yet. It'll be out in October. But a big piece of it is if you can hold space for your pain, you're set. Because you will have pain. We're not going to avoid it. But if you can always be that frontline person and that's what the that's what these permission slips are, right? It's you being at the oh front line. Well, and I love what you're saying. Now you're making me think. If you hold space for your pain, you you hold space for everyone else's. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is, and I think so much of the inner work really brings out an outward change. You feel so much more connected to the people in your life. Your maybe it's your children, your partner. You know, it's your boss. And then you see the world just so much differently and you see yourself differently and you stop looking at other people thinking, like you said, like they have it all together and they live these beautiful, you know, airbrushed social media lives. And it's like, oh, we're all kind of trying to 
be a part of this world and figure it out. Right. And no one is ever done. No. If they tell you you're done, got news for you. <laughs> they're lying. Well, they're completely in denial. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's so true. It's so true. So I think I love that you're giving this very simple but impactful tool. Right. So thank you. It's so cool. It's so, so cool. I have one more question about that before we move on to the other piece of the work, which is, do you actually write them out or do you just, I mean, you do because of you're doing it on social media, but I know with Brene Brown, she has had, you know, you can actually write the permission slip. Like it was like you're getting a permission slip to leave school early from your parents. Do you write them or do you, are you now at a place where you can just stop and think it through? What has been your progression with this? Good question. No one's ever asked me that. I think, so for me, I generally write them. And I think that has been a good practice for me to slow down and stop. But um, I had a conversation with a friend who has been writing his permission slips. And he said that he's noticing that he'll fall into giving himself permission. And then later he can say, oh, wow, I just allowed myself to do that. Mm, and I think that absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I'll really have to sit back and reflect on that to think about when are there times that I'm just allowing something to happen that I generally wouldn't have allowed to happen before in the past. Right, right. Oh, I love it. I do. I really do. And I really encourage people to go and follow you because I do think it is, even though I know it's perfect for us and it's I- ideal for us to be doing it on our own, I do think it's lovely to have it be modeled for other people. I think that that's really powerful. Oh, I have to jump in. I think for me, like if you think, so I actually had a class assignment where I had to really kind of conceptualize what I think radical permission is. And honestly, I think there's three levels to it. It's nested within a community. And then the community has like an instructional leader. I think of myself as that leader, as someone that is modeling both how to do a permission slip and also modeling how to support others with their permission slips. And then the final component of that is the self-practice. Right, right. But one, these can't exist without the other. If not, to me, I don't think it's radical permission. It's just not. It's not we don't exist in containers. And, you know, I think a lot of some of the more Western mental health practices, especially in the last 30 years, are so individually focused. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know I've got goosebumps listening to you say that because it is so true, isn't it? This is a community endeavor. And I think that's one of the elements of what makes it radical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And yet, one of these components can't exist without the other. Right. It's the unlearning, isn't it? Right. So I, as a child, if you're in an environment that doesn't support this kind of work, if you're in a, then an environment where there are people, it is the unlearning of, of that, you know, that, you know, it's so important. Yeah, it's so, and the unlearning, I'm just want to validate for people out there is so exposing, feels so vulnerable, so raw. Right. When you wreck, when you feel like when you push someone trying to help you experience your own power and your own sense of autonomy over your body, your thoughts and your ideas, and then your behaviors from that. Right. Whoa. Yeah, yeah it is. It is. I, it's funny. I love when I have these um, teen clients and we're talking about a concept and I can see them like, shaking their head and they're, and they're just, they're like, nope, 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 not going there with you. Nope. No, thank you. That's all. Well, they'll roll their eyes or something. And then upon second and third conversation, there's a, there's a body shift for them. I'm like, really? I could do that? Really? Interesting. Right. And I, and I, there's a total mm-hmm. body shift. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you, you, I mean, I'm just so grateful you're doing this for people, you know, all over the world. So it's very, very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So this is like, I mean, I'm so geeked out right now because I love compassion, but this is, I just really (laughs) cannot wait to talk to you about this. (laughs) 
I'm you're so gonna hear curious. me fumbling around this. No. I just want to put that on the table. Well, I'm gonna fumble too because I really I don't I just let's just fumble together, right? I, I follow uh, Lisa Renee Taylor and she always says stumble bravely, right? So she's saying you know it's just and so I'm like yes, let's stumble bravely, right? You on your Instagram have Petty Tuesday. Now, I'll be totally open with you. The word Petty, I had like this visceral body experience. When I first saw this, I was like, what is he doing? Mm-hmm. Is we're like petty? Because in my mind, petty just had this connotation to it. I think again, it's the unlearning, right? It's the unlearning of like, what? We we're we're going, we're going for petty? Like, what's he doing? <laughs> Oh my goodness. But but I, now I'm hooked on it. Like <laughs> I love it. I can't get enough of it. And it's that's the thing, right? It's the unlearning. So let's just go from the start. What is Petty oh Tuesday? Gosh. So something was happening in the national headlines. And I was just like, really? Come on. It was like hearing about one of these talk show hosts, like having a really bad toxic culture. And I was like, what on earth? And so I just started talking on my stories about it. Like I literally would talk about it with my friends. Like this is a really messy situation. People are being harmed and people are being hurt. You know, I was like, you know, not to be petty about it. I mean, Petty Tuesday. And then people started DMing me and laughing about the fact that I said Petty Tuesday. And so then I just started incorporating it because I honestly started having fun with it. It feels really <laughs> playful. It is. And, you know, it's interesting because I looked up the word petty and there's like all these different definitions. But the one that I really like is it's childish. It really yeah. is childish. It's playful. It's an opportunity. It's an invitation not to take ourselves too seriously. Yeah. Yeah. You see, this is why I loved it. So I have a Buddhist training too. And, you know, I've really been working for many, many years since my own, I had an eating disorder since my recovery on, you know, like trying to rid pit petty, like, you know, we don't want petty, right? And we, we want to, we don't want to engage in too much anger because, you know, there's, you know, that's got its own pain and suffering with it. And I'm doing, not that I'm saying any of these things are bad, but And then you're like totally leaning in over here. Yeah, I think, you know, the sort of the idea of toxic positivity and how broken that is. And I think there's some wisdom about honoring our pettiness, not honoring it to be fixed to it, but to realize that there's space for it because you either acknowledge your petty or your petty will really reign you. Yeah, yeah. I just love, so the reason that this showed up for me and there was a shift for me, like I said, there was like a three minute, like, what is he doing over there? And then it was like a, wait, what he's doing is he's practicing Mm non-judgment, right? mm -hmm. I was like, he's, so, and now I'm watching every Tuesday and the people are like posting their petty things. And I'm just like, this is so great. We're having an emotion and we're not going, oh, that's so bad. I shouldn't be feeling that way. And what's wrong with me and all the things? We're just going, yep, it's Petty Tuesday. That's what we do, right? Yeah. And I think there's something about the discipline of doing it on one day in particular okay. that mm-hmm. I've found I like that. people, honestly, I completely stumbled, well, not bravely, <laughs> but I stumbled into this. And now everyone's like, oh my gosh, I love Petty Tuesday. And I will be honest, sometimes it's become a piece of, I'll use a term, brand that I'm like, people really like this, but like, <laughs> no, I see myself differently than this. I see myself cross-legged on some mountain, you know, and it's like, but everyone's like, they're feeling seen by it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's it's the opposite of the position, the permission slip. When I think about it, that might be why I'm hooked because on the permission slip, you're giving permission to do this beautiful thing. And with Patty Tuesday, you're giving yourself permission to be around emotions that we would usually like disavow. You've just got this whole spectrum going on. You know, you are doing my, you are articulating some parts of my process that I have not quite figured out yet. You know, how much do I owe you for this session? (laughs) No, actually, I'm trying to figure it out myself, right? Because this is why I really think, okay, so I'm a consumer in this perspective, right? So this has Mm -hmm. been learning for me and and even noticing in myself, like, oh, isn't that interesting? My first reaction was like, hand over, like people can't see my hand over my, like, 
petty. We, like it's like, taboo. Yeah. Like what, what are we doing here? Well, yeah. And I think part of it is, you know, being a gay man, it's like pettiness and kind of cattiness. That's what the stereotype is of gay men. And yet it's, it's, it's part of our culture. Mm. Mm. You know, people love, and I think there's this idea of why folks love like RuPaul's Drag Race is because it leans into the non-seriousness of living and how really a lot of these constructed boundaries about what's okay to do and what's not okay to do is socially constructed. So we have to socially deconstruct them or to use your term, unlearn them. Right. I love it. And you do it so well. I mean, I think if, and this is why I love it, because if I think I did Petty Tuesday, it would just be like a venting session. (laughs) It wouldn't look the same. Okay. Right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I was going off about a celebrity couple that got back together. And then later, <laughs> I, <saw> <laughs> I later felt guilty about that. I was like, you know what? I felt like I went too far with that. But this is where the compassion work is helpful. It's like, yeah, that might have been a tiny bit mean spirited. But like in the big scheme of things, it's not that big of a deal. And yeah. also it's like, it's been so transformative for me to recognize that I can use my voice and the power of my ability to communicate. And I might hurt people. And there are times that I have hurt people in my past. But wow, does it feel great that I can be accountable to my word and say, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I often think we wouldn't need a cancel culture if we allowed more space for radical accountability. Yeah, I agree. I agree. No, I, I'm loving it. Don't change a thing. Like, don't. Because I, like, I think it's, it's beautiful. I'm really in love with it. Because, again, I think that even from the anxiety, you know, w- the work I do, like, let's actually look at, you said, like, toxic positivity. It's so important to address that, right? I had a lot of this in my childhood, right? Like, you don't, you know, we don't feel, we don't, we don't do patty. Mm-mm. Like when we don't do angry and we don't do mm, those mm-hmm, other things, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so as I'm loving this idea of like, I can make space for all of the feelings and I can also just embrace the humanness that is petty, mm-hmm. right? Because I don't think yeah. everybody's everybody's thinking petty. Yeah. Like, you know, this morning I went to the gym. This is my petty thought of the day. And okay, so the gym has music you know, you can hear in, throughout the whole gym space. And then you have folks that are walking around with their phones on speakerphone so that you can like hear their music like it's their own private boombox. And I'm like, but I thought, isn't that what headphones are for? <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, get yourself like, some headphones. <laughs> what? And, you know, I'm like, oh my goodness, whatever. Okay. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, like, this is a first world problem. But the pettiness in me is like, come on now, boo. Right. No, but see, this is, so I'm liking this, right? This is what I'm saying. And I was just actually about to say, give me your petty of the day, right? (laughs) I I Like, yes. And my petty is probably more related to my children. I'm like, do I have to say it 12 times? Like, do I have, do I have to put your left shoe on? Come on, your left one. well, can I ask you a question? Sure. Even I hate it when people are on podcasts and they're like, can I ask you a question? That's a pet peeve of mine and a petty, right? But like <laughs> doing it after sort of doing, going through your petty process about, you know, with your children, what does that do for you? Well, I actually did a post on this this week because I've actually been really working through my relationship with venting. And I think this is why you probably, if I were to really look into it, you probably started this work I'm doing. Which so you is, owe me a copay. I do. We're actually even at this point. So we'll just, <laughs> <laughs> we'll balance the sheets out in the end of the session. <laughs> but I think, I think that it probably was, if I really think it was probably spurred by this, is to start to reflect on when I open up space for this, like, I don't want to call it negative emotion because it's not, but just for emotions that bring up some suffering for me, right? My instinct is to shut it down. And I think what that means is it shuts down, it shuts down, it shuts down until I get to the point where I need to vent. And by that point, the boiler has gone and it's coming out, right? And so I've been working at at 
better instead holding space for the petty, right? So I don't have to vent. Like, I don't want it to get Mm -hmm. to that place. Not that there's anything wrong with venting either, right? No, I love what you just said. And I'm I'm really going to slow down and hear that because I think what it brings up for me is, you know, a lot of our somatic practitioners would tell us that, like, we need the energy to keep moving. Really, pettiness is just another form of energy. It's not good or bad. It's just another form of energy. Right. And we, we, and I think what you're saying is, and what I'm hearing is like, let's open up the space to let the energy keep moving. Mm-hmm. So that way it doesn't become locked up like a dam. Right. So that when it gets so full. Right. Because the, the I think the issue with that is like it can get so full and burst and then it starts this whole cycle of feeling the shame and feeling the guilt of a complete eruption. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So if I like step into my petty, it doesn't feel good because of the learned judgment on that. Mm, yes, but yes, but yes, it's yes. me. Learn. I've, I'm learning that if I can stay with the feeling of that, it doesn't feel good, but it also feels good it will save me from the really not feeling good when I go into like vent mode. Right. And so, so for me, it's been really, like I said to you, I I was like, I just love it. I do. I really do. I think it's beautiful as long, you know, and I think that the conversation we actually had on Instagram, because I did a post on this was people's conversation around like, but you can't take that away from me. Right. Like I want, I really, I'm at a stage in my life where I need to be a lot petty or a lot venting. Right. And I think for every people, for people, it's different. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, of course. Thank you. So do you have bigger patty days than other days? Like, is there, is this like, what's the influx Mm. of petty for you? I don't think of myself as a petty person. It's interesting that I have an experience, I think being sort of a, an immigrant and being a military child and, kind of accepting life as it is, a lot of acceptance energy of things that other people might complain about is part of my story. So I think there are days where I may have to lean in my petty and sort of get a little bit more, I get, but that's anger, which feels a little bit different for me. But yeah, I might feel a little bit aggravated a little bit more often some days compared to others. It's not something that I necessarily have probably the most tuned into. So you're offering me an invitation to to think about that a little bit more and to contemplate on it. I love it. I love it. Okay. So is there anything that you feel like we've missed here? Like, you know, we're stumbling bravely. So what what do you feel like there's something about Petty Tuesday, the concept of being petty for people that they may want to sort of consider as they move into embracing this? I think the thing that's really important to know is that it's vulnerable. Even being petty is vulnerable and and allow your pettiness, allowing yourself to come out to your own inner pettiness because you're unlearning something and you're trying something else on that you've never tried before. And so it's going to feel scary. And I think especially when you're riding the wave of a new emotion, you don't know what's going to come out. You don't know who's going to come out on the other side of it. And so I really want to validate and normalize all of that. And I do think there needs to be some safeguards on the other side. Like there's a difference for me between pettiness and mean spiritedness and complete like toxic negativity. Okay. It's helpful to hear. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you differentiate that? Pettiness has a playfulness for okay. me. Okay. Yeah. And I think the playfulness, again, not taking myself too seriously. You know, when you think about children playing and you think of yourself playing, like it's a wide, o- for me, it's a wide open field of discovery and mean spiritedness. The energy just feels like a dark cloud or like there's a monster and it's like, Ooh, I don't really like that energy. I'm not judging it. I'm just saying I don't really want more of it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's a, a small shift in that it's intended to create harm, right? Like it's intended to displace whatever you're feeling kind of thing. So I, I can feel that too. I think that that's a really good differentiation. 
Uh, and <laughs> I just love it, though. I can't help but I just laugh when I well, think see, about look, it. Look, I mean, you're smiling yeah. about it. Yeah, that's it. it that's not it. It's so perfect. Well, there's something fun about it. And, you know, people look forward to celebrating Petty Tuesday. Like people are like, Hayden, please create merch so I can wear a <laughs> Petty Tuesday t-shirt. And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you totally should. You totally should. Yeah. This is, I mean, I, again, I think it's one of those important lessons that we have to unlearn, you know, which is, you know, there isn't really an emotion you can't touch on. Maybe that for those who are new to this, their permission slip could be I'm going to allow myself to feel some petty. Mm -hmm. I love it. Play with that. Absolutely. I think so much of unlearning and learning something new is play. Yeah. Giving yourself space to try it out. Right. Commit to it and try it out. Right. Yeah. Permission slip to be petty or to be aggravated. I mean, one of the permission slips, and this is a different emotion that has completely changed my life was right after the murder of George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, I wrote a permission slips to myself to channel my anger, to rehumanize my myself in the midst of dehumanization. And I did not recognize the connection, but after that, I wrote this piece that went viral in the therapist community called An Invitation to White Therapists. Mm. And it's completely changed my world. It's got me in conversations with mentors of mine, people that have huge followings and are they're famous in my world because I gave myself that permission. Yeah. And to really, really experience and feel that emotion and to trust that my container, my nervous system, that my body could hold whatever might come out on the other side. I definitely think having relationships that are there to support you in your play of discovering who you might be on the other side is really important and fostering that. And that's made all the world of difference to me. Yeah, yeah. I thank you for sharing that because I, I really do resonate with that as well as I think, you know, that feelings are scary, right? And I think that we don't give ourselves permission because we don't want to feel what, could come with that, right? And so I love, particularly around those conversations that, you know, are those very difficult topics. I think it's so important that we slow down, maybe write out a permission slip first. I know I have to do that all the time with social media is, okay, What? how do I navigate this conversation? Can I be okay with it being imperfect? You know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I'm am so grateful for you bringing that up because I think that's amazing. Okay. I actually have one more question for you and then I want okay. you to tell people. So you've said when we were pre having this conversation that you're a curator of radical permission. What is that? Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I have to be honest, like some of this is, you know, based on sort of rising strong process of Brene Brown's book. But I do think I've moved it forward in making it a collective practice. Yep. And so I think of myself as the curator because I, do I own this? You know, I think our, sort of our Western way of like, we own things. Mm. Like, do I own this? No. Like, if anything, I feel like more of the shepherd of it. Mm -hmm. And I hope that this lives beyond me. Yeah. Honestly. And so I think I love the word curator, you know, thinking about someone that is there to be a custodian of a space and of a process. And, you know, there needs to be some editing. So there has to be some power that I hold of the process because you need to make sure that it stays within sort of the, the pathos and the ethos of really what the values are underpinning it. Yeah. So I think that's why I use the term curator. Mm. I love it. I love it. Okay. Tell us where people can hear about you. I'm so grateful for this conversation. Really, I am. These are just like the, I could do this. I could literally talk to you about this for hours on end, <laughs> but I'm not going to take your time up. Tell us where people can hear your stuff and learn more from you. Yeah. So you can follow me at HC Dawes on Twitter, as well as on Instagram. There is a Radical Permission Facebook group that you can search. And you can also head to my website at hcdaws.com. I also have a monthly newsletter where I talk about all the things that are important to me. And I hope it offers you value. I always 
offer something for you to contemplate about your life, as well as there's always a petty moment, (laughs) as well as different (laughs) trainings that I'll be offering and different upcoming events. Yeah. Thank you so much. Like I said, absolutely just grateful for you. You're, You're doing amazing work. Thank you. Please note that this podcast or any other resources from cbtschool.com should not replace professional mental health care. If you feel you would benefit, please reach out to a provider in your area. Have a wonderful day and thank you for supporting cbtschool.com.